Hello and welcome to Let's Get Civical Taking Action. I'm Carrie Turney Ross, Adult Services Coordinator. Today we're going to talk about the many ways that you can take action and move the needle on the issues that matter to you. I've compiled some resources to do just that. We'll discuss the ins and outs and what you'll need to properly plan a protest, a letter writing campaign, or a social media campaign. Uh, just a disclaimer, this is not a political program. We will not tell you um, what issues to take action on. Uh, we're just giving you resources on how to take action. So I am going to go ahead and share my screen. So let's get typical, taking action. Today, we're going to talk about uh, a little bit of an intro to activism, getting organized, um, protest planning, letter writing campaigns, and social media campaigns. So what is an activist? An activist is a person who believes strongly in a political or social change uh, and takes action in activities such as public protest to try to make that happen. Uh, an activist can be someone who shares something online uh, using a hashtag, can be someone who goes to a protest, someone who plans a protest, um, an activism, an, an activist, uh, that, that word really does encompass a lot of things on all sides of the political spectrum. And uh, so it's important to kind of hone in on what a, an activist is. <laughs> so I've got this video here on activism from the Gale video series, and I'm going to play that now. Engaging in activism to raise awareness and inspire action has been used throughout history and across the world to drive social, economic, environmental, and political change. Activism can be described as taking purposeful action to achieve change for a specific cause. That action can range from peaceful to violent and can include such tactics as protest marches and sit-ins, boycotts, letter writing campaigns, social media and hacking, civil disobedience, hunger strikes, and other acts of physical self-harm that garner media attention, armed uprisings, and terrorism. Activists can include individuals, small local or large international groups, or highly organized advocacy groups. When large groups of people unite over a common cause, it may become a recognized social movement. Many modern social movements focus on issues of social justice, the belief that every person deserves equal economic, political, and social rights. Often, the actions of a single individual can inspire and come to represent a social movement or cause. Frederick Douglass escaped slavery to become a leader in the American abolitionist movement. Susan B. Anthony and Emmeline Pankhurst were leaders of the American and British suffragette movements. Both Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. famously used peaceful, nonviolent tactics to lead movements for India's independence and civil rights in the United States. Rosa Parks' refusal to give up her seat to a white man on a Montgomery, Alabama bus in 1955 earned her the title Mother of the Modern Civil Rights Movement. Cesar Estrada Chavez was a migrant worker who became a grassroots labor organizer. He founded and led the National Farm Workers Association, the first effective agricultural union in the United States. Larry Kramer, an American screenwriter, stepped up as an activist for LGBTQ rights when he became one of the first persons to publicly sound the alarm on the HIV AIDS epidemic. Nelson Mandela spent his life fighting for the rights of black South Africans who had suffered government mandated discrimination under the apartheid system. The fight for social, political, economic, and environmental causes, even after goals are achieved, often continues to be fought by new generations. An example is the Black Lives Matter movement, which arose in 2013 from a social media hashtag campaign over the lack of accountability for violence against black people, especially police violence. 
By 2020, activists had abundant video evidence of excessive use of force by police against black people. Incidents that resulted in the deaths of black men and women increased support for the movement. In the spring of 2020, George Floyd died after a Minneapolis policeman kneeled on his neck for nearly eight minutes. When video of this event went viral, protest marches sprang up across the United States, as well as in cities throughout the world. The fight for women's rights is another example of a cause that has continued into the 21st century. Gloria Steinem, following in the footsteps of earlier advocates for women's rights, led the feminist movement in the late 1960s and early 70s. Although some of the goals of the feminist movement had been met, there were many, including ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment, that had not been achieved by the time Steinem spoke at the 2017 Women's March on Washington. With attendance estimated at 4.6 million across the United States alone, it was the largest single-day protest event in U.S. history. Based on a movement started more than a decade earlier by activist Tarana Burke, on October 15th, 2017, a Twitter post from American actress Alyssa Milano encouraged all women who had been sexually harassed or assaulted to change their online status to Me Too, launching what came to be known as the Me Too movement. With millions of women responding, among them many high-profile Hollywood celebrities, the result has led to many dismissals, firings, and even convictions within the entertainment industry and corporate world. The spirit of activism is abundantly evident in young people today as leaders and participants. Malala Yousafzai was only 15 years old when she defied the Taliban by attending school and writing a blog about her intention to get an education forbidden for girls in Afghanistan under Taliban rule. Taliban gunmen boarded her school bus in 2012 and shot her in the head. Yousafzai and her family were moved to the United Kingdom where she was treated, recovered, and continued to speak out on the importance of education for girls. In 2014, she became the youngest person ever to receive a Nobel Peace Prize. Greta Thunberg first learned about climate change and its effects on the environment at school when she was eight years old. She staged a solo protest on the steps of Sweden's parliament building in 2018 at age 15, then gained worldwide fame for sailing across the Atlantic, avoiding air travel, in order to speak at the United Nations Climate Action Summit in September of 2019. That same year, she was also nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. After a tragic shooting in 2018 that killed 14 of their classmates and three staff members at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, students created the hashtag Never Again Movement to advocate for better gun safety laws. Online activism such as this has become an important tool used by organizers and advocates to reach wider audiences much more rapidly than was ever possible for activists in the past. Have you ever participated? All right, so we'll go ahead and stop it there. All right, so there are really five main types of activism uh, grouped here as demonstrations. So that includes protests, vigils, marches, things like that. Letters and petitions. So these are used to pressure public officials or power holders. Um, and doing it, uh, it can be done by email or physical letters. Um, the evidence is a little, it seems to go both ways. I've seen articles that talk about it being equally effective to send an email but I've seen a lot saying that it's it's more effective to send a physical letter. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, and then social media activism. So that's the hashtags. The, um, this is great for raising awareness because it can be seen by a lot of people. Uh, there's also boycotts. So avoiding purchases from certain companies. And, and that is where regular people get to use their economic impact to make a change. And then strikes, uh, where workers are trying to get better uh, workers' rights, better wages, better working conditions, uh, things along those lines. 
Today, we're going to focus mostly on uh, demonstrations, letters and petitions, and social media. So let's get civical. The first thing you need to do, this is where you should always start, get organized. Um, you want to research the issue. You want to build your community and define your goals and strategies. So research. You really want to get to the heart of the issue. What is going on that needs to be changed? Who is most affected by it? What action needs to be taken? And who in your community is already working on this issue? Um, it could be that there are already local organizations in place working uh, towards change. And so it's good to know who they are to either get them to kind of buy into your activism, your uh, protest, your letter writing campaign, whatever it is you choose to do, um, or to see if you can help what they're already doing. Uh, I wanted to highlight some library resources that can be helpful in doing this research. Um, our Gale databases cover a wide variety of topics. Uh, I really like, especially when we're talking about um, activism, opposing viewpoints. I actually uh, leaned on that a lot while we're uh, working on this presentation. Canopy is a online streaming service available for your library. And what's great about Canopy is it has a lot of documentaries that you might not be able to find in other places. And I'll bet there's going to be a documentary on the topic you're uh, interested in. Newsbank can provide you access to local newspapers, but also newspapers around the nation. And um, that way you can see what's going on, what are the current events. And then of course we have a wide variety of print and eBooks. Now you wanna build your community. So again, looking at those community organizations, seeing if you can volunteer with them, see if you can um, work with them to make change on this particular topic. Uh, you can also build community on social media. Uh, you can make a Facebook group uh, for local people to come together in the digital world to talk about the, the issues that matter and, and talk about how you can take steps towards change. Next door is another one that is helpful in finding locals, um, local people who also feel the same way as you do about this topic. Uh, also, your friends your family, your neighbors, reach out to them, build that community, and then find a place to meet. In this COVID world, it might be that you have to meet virtually. Uh, so, you know, finding a good platform that works for everybody uh, is a, a good idea. Um, in a non-COVID world, you might want to figure out a place to have weekly meetings to make decisions and take action. Next, you wanna develop your goals and strategies. So again, what is it that you really want to accomplish? What change do you want to see? And make these goals smart goals. So they need to be specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-based. And then finally, um, you want to determine your strategy. So you might decide after doing all of the research, after um, building the community, that you want to do a protest or you might decide that a protest isn't right for this, this issue. And instead you wanna do a letter writing campaign. Um, and remember, you can always use multiple activism strategies. And uh, I would say that there's evidence that supports that using multiple strategies is most effective, especially in this modern online era. And then spread out the tasks amongst your group uh, because if it all falls on one person, that person's gonna get burnt out and, and then they might lose interest in the issue or, or decide that it's just too much for them to take on. So really spreading those tasks out will be helpful to everyone to make sure that you stay passionate. So we're gonna talk about demonstrations, um, specifically protests now. So again, protests. Um, the end goal of protests is usually, not always, but usually to change a policy or a law. There's also vigils. Um, these can support a cause and they're typically held to remember a person or a group of people who are no longer with us. 
marches express opposition by marching with or without a license, typically to a government institution. Now, I want to say this about marches. Um, doing it without a license or a permit, you need to make sure that you are following any local ordinances. And we'll talk a little bit about that more later. But um, it's important that you don't block streets, you don't block businesses, um, and you don't do it on um, private property. And then sit-ins, that's another form of demonstrations, um, occupying an area until your demands are met. So we're planning a protest. <clears throat> First thing you wanna do, assemble. Assemble your team, gather those who feel that action is necessary and lean on that community. If you already did the work before de um, determining your strategy, you've already done this. You've, that's one step that's already taken care of. Um, be sure to exchange contact information with your community. Um, that probably goes without saying, but uh, it's worth mentioning. <laughs> Next step, you wanna organize. So figure out the structure of your, your movement, your group, the, the community that is making this action. Um, do you want there to be leadership, people who are figureheads of the program, of the, um, of the action, or do you want it to be more of a non-hierarchical hier structure? Uh, so there's not a figurehead. Everyone is equal, the work is spread out equally, and everyone is working toward that common goal. And um, yeah, and then assign those tasks. Step three, define. Define your goals. What do you want to accomplish? What will this protest actually accomplish? Define your messaging. And this is kind of a, a two-parter. Um, define your messaging to the people that you want to get involved. Uh, you know, the people that you want to come and be a part of that protest, but also the messaging that you want to send out to the um, decision makers and then decide who your audience is. Um, and this means those decision makers. Are you um, directing this towards government officials, companies, board of directors, uh, you know, who, who is the, the person or people who can actually make that change once they've heard your call for action? Then you wanna do research, 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 research. Um, look into your local laws. Do you need a permit to protest? Um, you know, every city, every township is gonna be different. And, and what they require might be different. So it's very important to contact your, your city officials, find out if you need that permit um, so that you're doing everything uh, correctly and making sure that your, your protest won't be shut down before it can actually make some noise. Uh, research locations. Uh, where do you want this protest to happen? And the location should be at least one of these three things. It should be practical or symbolic or convenient or all three or some combination of two. And then also research other protests that were effective in making change. What did they do? How can you borrow from their model? Next step, you need to prepare. Pick a date and a time. And I would argue that this should also be um, one of those three things we just talked about, uh, convenient, you know, let me pull it back up, uh, convenient, symbolic, or practical. So decide on the time and date of your protest. You've done the research, you found out, yes, you need a permit, go ahead and get it. If you found out you don't, then you're good to go. Um, but either way, whether you've got a permit or not, it is important to inform your local law enforcement. Um, if they see a big group of people and they don't know what's going on, it could be dangerous for everyone involved. So it's important to inform them. Uh, plan the event timeline. So what all do you want to happen at this protest? If it's just a bunch of people gathered around, it's not as likely to be effective. 
but if you, you know, you might want to have a speaker, a community leader, um, maybe you want to bring a band in, I don't know, um, but plan out the timeline of events and make sure that people know about it. And then gather materials. So you might want to make flyers, pamphlets, things like that, that you can use both to spread the word about the protest, but also about the message, what it is you're, you're trying to change. And then, you know, a lot of people might bring their own posters, might make their own posters at home, but it might be smart to go ahead and bring some supplies so that folks can make posters together there at the protest. Then you wanna publicize it. So when you're doing a protest, the aim is to get media attention. You also want to publicize it to the people that you want to come and participate. So you can use social media channels, and, and this is where a social media campaign can be very helpful. Uh, you want to make some flyers, spread it out, send them to local community organizations, and um, make sure that people know when and where it's happening. And call your local news outlets. Um, call the radio station, call the, the TV news, let them know that this is going to happen and say, hey, I think you should have someone here covering it. And then you also want to know your rights. So the First Amendment of the Constitution says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, and this next part is really important here, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people uh, to peaceably assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So you have that right to free speech. Um, but then also, if you did have to get that permit, make sure you follow those uh, guidelines in the permit and, and make sure that the people participating know what those guidelines are so that everybody is able to stay safe and, and, and make sure that they're um, staying within those guidelines. If you are on public property, you have the right to speak out as long as you're not blocking access to government buildings. So, so make sure that you're not blocking. Um, make sure that when you're, when you're speaking out that people can still come in and out who are not part of your movement. Um, you have the right to photograph as long as it doesn't violate a person's reasonable expectation of privacy. This is very important. Um, you, uh, in on public property, you do have that right to photograph just as long as people are not in a, in a state where they would reasonably be expected to have privacy. And then um, when you're on private property, the owner can set the rules on their own property. So it's really important when you're doing that research phase um, to make sure that you're, you're looking at locations that are public, um, not private. And then lastly, you wanna keep it safe. Bring a first aid kit or a few. Um, don't use illegal tactics. Be respectful of, of law enforcement, but also of other people around you. Uh, who are maybe not a part of the protest. Don't vandalize, Just it just goes without saying. Um, don't do it and obey the law. Now, this is important, civil disobedience. If you plan on engaging in civil disobedience, so knowingly breaking the law to um, show that it's unjust maybe, um, you need to know the consequences. And those consequences are that you will likely be arrested if you are breaking a law. So now we're going to talk about letters and petitions and the letter writing campaigns. So with the letter writing campaign, the goal is to get as many constituents, as many people as possible to write to a decision maker. A petition, a formal written request signed by as many people to influence decision makers. And now, before I move on, um, I said earlier that, you know, there's debate on whether or not it's more effective to have physical letters mailed to someone or email. Um, 
you know, it really depends on what your, your movement is about on how you want to go about that. But from what I've read, and this is, this is what I've read, um, there are some uh, public officials who won't really pay as much attention to an email because it's hard to prove whether or not that person is actually a constituent. Um, but with a letter with an address and name on it, it's, it's easy to, easier to verify that that person is a constituent. Um, and then petitions, you know, there's a lot of online options for starting a petition, um, and it's just as effective to, to do it online. But now we're going to talk about planning your letter writing campaign. So again, here it is again, organize, assemble your team, define the issue or the cause, um, research the issue, but also research the decision makers. Uh, you really want to target these letters at people who can do something to change the issue at hand. And so you need to put that research time into who are those people and um, finding out how to send letters to them, what their address is, um, that's all publicly available. So um, be sure to research that as well. And then set a time span for the letters. So what this means is uh, instead of saying, just send the letter whenever you get a chance, say, we want people to send the letters between you know, starting this date and ending this date. And that way um, this decision maker is getting a flood of mail about that issue all within a week um, or two weeks, however long you decide to have the, the campaign last. Next. You want to describe. This is describing it to the people you want to participate, who you want to also send a letter. Um, so you need to tell them, you know, why, why should they send a letter? Um, so what you want to talk about with, um, you, you might want to have this as a, a letter that you're sending out, or you might be canvassing, so going door to door. Um, and, and these are the things you want to talk about to encourage them to write a letter. What is the problem? What is the issue? What is the, the thing that you want changed? What is the impact? How is that issue that you want to be changed? How is it impacting your community, your life, your friends, your neighbors, um, their friends, their neighbors? Uh, so really talk about the impact and, and what a change could mean. And then you wanna call them to action call them on to participate in the letter writing campaign. And then you want to write the letter, um, you and the, the people participating with you. So this is how the letter should be, um, this, this is how the, the letter should be formatted. The first paragraph is the summary, what you are asking that decision maker to do and what the issue is. And, you know, just a brief summary of, of this is why I'm writing to you. Second paragraph, describe the problem. Really talk about the, the details of the problem and, and who it is a problem for. The third paragraph, suggest a solution. You might not have, uh, you know, a solid, this is exactly what needs to be done, but it could be something as simple as I want the opposite of what is happening to happen. And then the fourth paragraph is the action. What you want that decision maker to do. I want you to vote against this law. I want you to vote in favor of this law. I want you to do this, this, and this. Um, so that it's clear to them why it matters and, and what you, their constituent, the voters, want them to do. And now we'll talk about social media campaigns. Um, some of the benefits, uh, well, first, um, social media campaigns are often called hashtag activism um, or hash, I saw hashtagivism, I think. <laughs> um, people try to combine words that don't, don't always work, but hashtag activism is using a hashtag to spread the word. Um, you know, you might call it a pound sign, you might call it a number sign, 
the kids nowadays call it hashtag. Um, one of the great things about social media campaigns is there's a low barrier to participate. Anybody can participate in social media and spread the word using that hashtag. Um, it's a great way to spread awareness. And when you are out there in the community taking action on this topic, you can share pictures or videos using that hashtag and, and really amplify what's happen happening. Uh, also kind of the downside for social media campaigns is that there's a low barrier to participate. Uh, you can really, if you just share something, you don't really have to get out and do anything. And so um, it, it enables some people to just stop there. Um, the goal though, and part of the reason you wanna use multiple forms of activism is yes, you want them to share, but you also want them to do something else, something else that will help make change. So planning a social media campaign. Once again, organize, assemble your team, define the issue or the cause, research the issue and provide clear messaging. This is really important when you're starting a social media campaign. Um, you wanna make sure that what you're working towards is clear, um, that there's a clear goal in mind and that there's a clear um, action to be taken. Now you, it's the time for the call to action. You wanna let folks know how they can take action. Um, so this is getting them to go beyond just sharing and, and typing in the hashtag. Um, so you're calling folks to attend a protest, to get out and vote, to write a letter, to boycott a company, um, whatever it is that, whatever action is, um, you need to make it clear in your social media campaign. And it could be multiple things, but make that clear as well. And now the hashtag. Um, this is really important. I don't think enough people take this into consideration. Um, maybe they are now, but um, selecting your hashtag is a, not a process to be taken lightly. Whatever the term is, it needs to be relevant to the cause. So, um, you know, if you're using just random words that have no meaning to this cause, it's not going to be effective. Um, it needs to capture the essence of the, the cause. Um, it needs to be easy to understand. I've seen hashtags that are basically a full sentence and it is so hard to read. And when words are all squished together, it might read differently than you initially think it will. So be very careful on, on how many words are used in your, your hashtag. And then this, I cannot stress this enough, research the hashtag before using it. A quick search will tell you if this hashtag is already being used by another group. And, um, and you wanna make sure that it's fresh and new and not already in use, uh, because then that can cause some unclear messaging. Uh, if people are seeing the same hashtag being used by another group with another movement or or not even necessarily a movement, just a, a random thought. Uh, so, so really be sure that you're, you're researching that and, and coming up with something new. Um, it, you might have one that's perfect for your cause and then you look it up and it's already in use. Go ahead and, and switch it up, find something else to, to hashtag. And then just to wrap it up, um, I want to talk about, uh, I want to share this video about the importance of activism. I'm Dolores Huerta and I am 87 years old and I have been an activist since I was 25. That's 62 years and I'm still going strong. I do believe that the people that are being affected by the issues are the best ones that can solve them. We started the uh, National Farm Workers Association with Cesar Chavez, which became the United Farm Workers of America. Knowing that ordinary people have the power to come together to organize and that they can change policies, this is what really engaged me and really changed my life. 
and eventually I left being a school teacher uh, to become an organizer. The pivotal moment in my life uh, came when I met this great man named Fred Roth Sr. And I went to a meeting where he showed us uh, pictures of people who had organized themselves. By registering to vote, uh, he elected the first Latino to the Los Angeles City Council. The most effective way uh, to make changes is by organizing, especially at the grassroots level. I call going door to door, canvassing, organizing 101 because this is where you can really engage with the voter and explain the issues to them. People get confused and so they just throw up their hands and they don't vote. But we have to say to people, vote for what you're confident in voting, even if you have to leave some of the spaces blank. The important thing is to get in there and vote. We're seeing a new dawn of resistance, a new dawn of movements. And if we don't act responsibly, if we don't engage, then we have only ourselves to blame. All right. Um, so we talked a lot about activism and different types of activism today. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Um, I think taking from that video with Dolores Huerta, the important thing is, is knowing that you can make a change. You can, um, you know, move the needle on the, the issues that matter to you. It's just a matter of getting organized, doing the research, and doing the work. Um, we're here at Jackson County Library Services to help you, especially when it comes to research. Um, you can reach out to the Medford Reference Desk, the Ashland Reference Desk, or the, the library nearest you. Um, to get help finding uh, resources and articles and information on these important topics that matter. Uh, so, you know, sincerely reach out to us and we would be more than happy to help you. Uh, you can also contact me. I'm Carrie Turney Ross, the Adult Services Coordinator, and um, you can just email me and I will um, help you out where I can. And, um, and I hope to hear from you and, and see what kind of action you can take in your community. Thank you.